Uh, so I'm going to kick off by, you might as well settle back because we're not actually going to be tasting anything for a while. Uh, to put things in context and actually do kind of history of whiskey, the big picture, and then we'll do our kind of dive into different whiskey styles and at that point talk about whiskey production, where the flavours come from, <coughs> how you then use them, what's the difference between malts and blends, what's the difference between Scotch and Irish and Irish and Scotch and Japanese, what's bourbon all about, what's rye all about, and hopefully by the end of it you'll be as confused as I am. Uh, because nobody knows everything about whisky. Uh, that's the joy of it. If everybody did know everything about whisky, the world would be a really boring place. And whiskies would be really, really boring. But you know, every single day, you know, there's people a hell of a lot more intelligent than I, who know a hell of a lot more than I, who are continuing to uh, ask these interesting questions about flavor. You know, where does this flavor come from? How do we enhance this? What does this mean? How can we make things better and better? Uh, so it's a very exciting and dynamic category uh, at the moment. And this is a bit weird. For, I, I did an earlier session uh, essentially doing the same thing. So if I occasionally pause kind of going like that, it's mainly because I've said, I've already said that. But I actually already said it like three hours ago. So OK, excuse me. But, uh, and if you've heard it for the second time, tough. Uh, you know, whiskey is really, really exciting at the moment. There are, this is really a kind of golden age for world whiskies. There have never been as many countries producing whiskey uh, as there are now. I would say there's never been as many different styles as there are now. And I would also say there's never been as much interest as there is now. And uh, that is, is genuinely global. I'm off to Taiwan in a couple of days to do, do some work over there. That's now, what, the fourth biggest Scotch whiskey market. And that's basically come from, from nowhere. So you know, it is a global phenomenon. And the reason it's a global phenomenon, I think, is because today's consumer uh, is looking for flavor. Uh, today's consumer is looking for genuine stories, uh, not just made up marketing bullshit, uh, which is one reason I think why in white spirits, gin has suddenly revived uh, as against vodka, because suddenly gin is real uh, and vodka is kind of a little bit contrived occasionally. Uh, I think it's why you see a revival in rum I think it's definitely why you've seen a revival in all whisky styles, and not just scotch. Uh, and it's, it's quite unusual, actually. I uh, was talking to Mark uh, earlier on. It's actually quite unusual to do a whole whisky tasting. You know, I, I usually do a scotch one, or a Japanese one, or an Irish one, or a bourbon one. But to have everything all together is, is quite unusual. Uh, so let's kind of relax and enjoy, and please, please, please ask questions at any point. Uh, don't be scared of me just because I've got a Scottish accent. Uh, you know, ask a question because uh, the discussion will be a hell of a lot more interesting and more easy on you all if you suddenly go, actually, I don't understand that, or here's something I've always wanted to ask. I will give you an answer. It will probably be the right one. It might not be. It might just make it up. But you know, I will give you an answer, OK? Uh, and who's to know if it's not right or not? Anyway. Let's get started. Hello. Why have you? You're late, so you have to crawl on the table. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you've, yeah. Yeah. you've also managed to sit at the seat with no glasses in front of you, which either says a lot about what you were doing last night, or <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Uh, anyway, th there is a spare seat over here, uh, or or you can share glasses, or if you really want to sit together, you can. That's, that's fine. That's okay. So I don't want to split the class up. Uh, anyway, right, whiskey history. <clears throat> Uh, where did it come from? Uh, we don't know. Uh, who was the first distiller? We don't know. Uh, where was it first made? We don't know. Uh, which is good. Uh, it's a good way to start, really, because it allows me to be creative. Uh, in Scotland, uh, and when I say Scotland, uh, rather than seeing Scotland and Ireland uh, all the way through for the first little bit of, the, of this historical chat, basically the Scotch and the Irish whisky industries or whisky worlds in, in Scotland and Ireland evolved in pretty much exactly the same way right up until the beginning of the 19th century. So anything that I say with reference to Scotch up to the, t the time I begin talking about Irish specifically will apply to, to both these countries. Uh, <clears throat> the, first, pardon me, the first written record of a spirit being distilled in Scotland is in 1495. Uh, in the expense accounts of King James IV, uh, who was a profligate king, uh, and obviously, you know, the, the, the accountants had got, got hold of him and said, right, 
excuse me, Your Majesty, we have to work out what you're spending all our money on. Uh, and within that uh, was this reference to a man called Friar John Corr, uh, eight balls of malt, ball being a weight of malt, uh, wherewith to make aquavitae spirit. Uh, who was Friar John Corr? We don't know. Uh, I have a funny, sneaky feeling that Friar John Corr was simply the man at the monastery taking like a DHL delivery. You know, I don't know, I don't even know Friar John Corr. Nobody knows if he was a, a distiller or not, or he happened to be the guy standing there writing his name on the bottom of the piece of paper. Uh, we don't know who he was, we don't know where he came from. It was somewhere in Scotland, probably in Fife. Uh, was he making whiskey, or were they making whiskey? No, they were making spirit, they were making aquavitae. Probably for medicinal purposes, maybe as part of uh, alchemy, uh, sort of various researches. Yes, question? No, so really. So they were making whiskey in monasteries? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, monasteries were kind of the universities of their day. Uh, so monasteries, you know, and indeed universities, quite, because there's a couple of universities in Scotland at that point, but they were the seats of learning. Uh, so the monks would have been brewing, uh, so it's logical uh, that the monks would have then uh, gone into distillation. Also, by that time, a lot of the texts, the early texts about distillation, had been translated from Arabic, which they were originally, uh, into Latin. Uh, and, and the only people who would really uh, be able to, to read them would be uh, people working, uh, living rather, uh, in monasteries or indeed at, at some of the universities. Uh, so yeah, so it could have been alchemy, it could have been medicine, uh, could have been for uh, military purposes, uh, who knows, it probably wasn't being drunk. The received wisdom, as far as, as whiskey goes, and there's various accounts of, of this happening in Ireland at the same time. Uh, slightly later, the first written accounts, but it would be contiguous. Uh, and it was kind of the received wisdom was that it remained as a medicine for about 200 years. but. If actually you look at the first history of Scotland, which was written in 1526 uh, by a man called Hector Boyce, who was uh, the, the principal of Aberdeen University, uh, he writes, uh, when my <coughs> forebears were of a set purpose to be merry, and I like that, a set purpose, you know, they weren't just going, what are we going to do tonight? They were going, we, we really want to have a good time tonight. You know, we are determined to get ready. This is very Celtic. We are going to get pissed. Uh, they would... Uh, they would flavour their aquavitae with herbs and spices from their garden rather than imported. Uh, which says to me that the cutting costs, because obviously spice is hugely, import, uh, hugely expensive at, at that particular time, 16th century, uh, and they were flavouring things up with what was uh, around them. That to me suggests that they weren't just redistilling wine, that they were actually using beer. That kind of makes logical sense. Ushkaba is born as a result of this. In other words, it becomes a medicine, and probably was a medicine and was a, a drink at the same time. They ran parallel to each other for 100, 150, maybe even 200 years. But people were drinking it for pleasure uh, from a really early time, from an earlier time than perhaps we'd, we'd thought. Ushkaba uh, became a bit of an Irish speciality. It was made in Scotland, it was also made uh, in Ireland. And basically, Ushkaba referred to the flavoured up whisky. So it would have had various things added to it. The, the recipes get more and more complex uh, uh, the more you go on. When you get up to 17th century, 18th century Ushkabas, you're using uh, one of the, the ways to differentiate Ushkaba from, from various other liqueurs was they always added saffron to it, so it was coloured up. Uh, they were using spinach root uh, to make it green. Uh, it was often, it was known, as I said, as a speciality of the Irish. And remained as a flavoured up drink or speciality right up until the 19th century. Uh, it moved over to France called, and it was known as Scoobag uh, in France, in French, it was kind of a bastardization of Ushkaba. And if you look at uh, the only Williams, the flowing bowl, I don't know if you've ever read that, it's a 19th century uh, New York bartender. Uh, it's a great, great book, a cocktail book. 19th century, he's got a recipe for scubac in there. So it went all the way right up to 19th century, this flavoured up whiskey. Which kind of leads me to, uh, you realise this isn't a linear history, I'm kind of going off a weird tangent. Uh, at any point in whiskey's history where it has been at its most popular, it's either been flavoured, it's been mixed, it's been drunk long, it's been made into toddies or punches, 
or highballs or whatever. This idea that whiskey of any sort can only be drunk neat, uh, can only be drunk by men, can only be drunk by men of a certain age, can never be mixed, is simply not true. It's something, especially for Scotch and Irish, uh, that has taken hold oh, really over, oh, over the past 30 odd years. Thou shalt not touch. Bollocks. Whiskey is there to be enjoyed and it blossoms when it's mixed. And various whiskies are made to be mixed, which we'll come to when we talk more detail about blends. Anyway, that is kind of the, 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 where the roots of whiskey are. And it becomes a kind of really a speciality initially of the rural communities because they would have their surplus grain, which would be barley or might be oats, uh, but, or maybe wheat, but mostly barley or oats. The yeah, surplus of the grain, they would distill it uh, and they would share it. So they would share it with the community, they would share it with guests, or they would use it as effectively as currency for barter. You know, you want a cow, give them a cask of whiskey. You know, whatever, I don't know. I don't actually know exactly how, uh, how much you would exchange it for. But alcohol was currency for a very, very long time in, in Scotland, in Ireland, in England, certainly in the Caribbean and America, you know, as far as rum goes, uh, in the Caribbean and America, etc., etc. So it's currency for a long time. Small-scale distillation, your own crops, your inalienable right to make your distillate from your particular crop. By the time we get to the 18th century, things begin to shift because by then you've got larger distilleries getting established in the lowlands of Scotland. So that's the area between Glasgow and Edinburgh up into Fife, uh, where less barley is grown, more wheat is grown, so a different base cereal. And also larger commercial plants are beginning to start up. Also in the 18th century, what is happening in London, my friend? The gin craze. So there's a vast amount of gin, you know, an insane amount of gin being consumed. Six million gallons of gin are consumed in 1832 in London. You know, think about that. Think about that, you binge drinkers, and hang your heads in shame. You know, that's proper drinking. But, you know, it was horrible, horrible stuff. Uh, but there was this increasing demand. <coughs> For, for base spirit. So the, the Scots distillers, including Mr. Haig, uh, Mr. Steen, and we'll, we'll come across Mr. Haig, whose name has reappeared in a blue bottle called Haig Club. Uh, Mr. Steen, who we'll come to later on when we talk about Irish whiskey and, and distillation, uh, were part of a, a, an extended family who specialised in larger scale production, some of which was sold in Scotland, some of which would be exported to England to be rectified into gin. The government of the time wants to try and control this binge drinking, as governments always do. Uh, and they try various things, which is all of what the Gin Acts and, uh, is all about, which you'll hear about when Desmond do does his talk, uh, to try and control uh, consumption. One of the ways in which they did that was to tax stills on their capacity. In other words, the, high, the more volume you had in your still, the more tax you paid. And th these taxes were, were set incredibly high, which effectively drove a lot of distillers out, out of business completely. One way to get around that would be to distill quickly. So you would be taxed once in the capacity of your still, but if you ran that still very hard and very fast and very frequently, you would actually make up the tax that you paid. So the tax would be set off and you would begin to be able to make profit again. There's a problem with this, because the quicker you distill, the worse your spirit is going to be. You know, so these days, you know, uh, Lagavulin, for example, the spirit run in Lagavulin distillery is six hours long. These distilleries in the lowlands of Scotland that were distilling, a still could be completely distilled in two minutes. Okay? What do you think the quality of that spirit was like? <laughs> Shit. Okay? You know, don't be scared. It really was bad. It was bad stuff. But it was just going to be sold to the English, so it didn't really matter. It was going to be turned into gin. Uh, and the money, the money was going to be made. But when it came to the domestic market, if you are giving people this glass of filth, uh, they're not going to be drinking it. Mr. Haig, this is dreadful stuff. The stuff, therefore, in the highlands, and the islands made in the smaller stills, was going to be of better quality, maybe not to today's quality, but of better quality than what was coming from the lowlands. The only problem being that small-scale distillation had been effectively banned above the Highland Line in Scotland. <clears throat> this is partly the result of the temerity of the Scots to fight the English in the 1745 Jacobite Rebellion 
Uh, we forget about all these wars that took place in Britain in, in, in the 18th century. Uh, and this was kind of a, uh, the payback that a lot of these smaller distillers were really effectively put out of business uh, because you were allowed to make whiskey, but you could only have one still per parish, and it had to be a larger still that was actually possible uh, to run from a, from a commercial point of view because it was too large given the amount of grain that people would be able to supply. Uh, so therefore, the farm distillers in the Highlands and Islands are hit with a problem because their booze is currency. This is how they pay their rent, this is how they buy their cows, this is how they buy their cereal, perhaps. <clears throat> what did they do? Did they go, well, sorry, uh, okay, that's fine, it doesn't really matter, I, I'm just going to, I'm going to go off, I'm going to start up an IT company. You know, that's not really, that's not really an option, uh, you know, in, in the 18th and beginning of the 19th century. They continued to distill. So they, they became moonshiners, which is good as far as the, the people in the lowlands are concerned, because suddenly they are still getting uh, some supply of whiskey coming down from the highlands, but it is illicit. It's impossible to control, therefore the government steps in eventually, 1823, it changes the law and allows capital, capital to be invested in Scotch. So basically from 1823 on, you can see the start of what is now the modern Scotch whiskey industry taking place. The same thing exactly is happening in Ireland. So it's a split between big distillers in Ireland who are based in the, in the, mainly in the cities, uh, or larger towns in the cities, so Dublin and Cork being, being two, two major uh, centres, Belfast and Derry as well, and smaller scale distillers uh, in, in, in the countryside in Ireland. But essentially exactly the same thing is happening uh, in both countries. By 1850s, something has happened in Scotland. People have woken up. People have begun tasting the whiskies for what they are. You've got to remember that if you are a smaller distiller, you've been used, used to distilling over a small pot for your own community, and all of a sudden you've scaled up, and you've scaled up to produce thousands of gallons, or tens of thousands of gallons of, of, of whiskey, that's, that's litres, uh, of whiskey. It's not as easy to control. And also, it's an interesting thing about, about, about the human mind, is that if something is illegal, your critical faculties are switched off because it has the allure of it being illegal. Like, oh yeah, it might not be all that good, but you know, it's illicit. Well, that's good. Uh, whereas as soon as it becomes legal, eventually people kind of switch that back on and they go, but this is crap. And that's, and that's the issue. That's the issue that faced Scots distillers around about the 1850s. In 1850, the most popular spirit in Scotland was Irish whisky, because the Irish had cracked the issue. And the second most popular spirit in Scotland was rum. So in Scotland, we weren't even drinking our own produce. And obviously, to make that new industry profitable, it had to be exported. It had to be exported to England and around the world. But the quality clearly wasn't good enough. Uh, why did Ireland? Why was Ireland different? What had Ireland done? Well, as I said, you know, the, the Irish distillers had started off exactly the same way. But by the tail end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, big distilleries are getting built in Dublin, Cork, Belfast, Derry, etc., etc. One of the main ones was built by a man called John Jameson, a John Ch and then his sons, J.J. and S. Uh, Jameson, <coughs> as I always like to point out to my Irish friends, was Scottish. Uh, you know, so it was the Scots who actually taught the Irish how to make whiskey properly. But, you know, there we go. We can, de we, 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 we can debate that. Uh, so what Jameson and his colleagues uh, did, which, which included the Steen family, uh, Rose, uh, the Power family, of uh, Power's fame, etc., etc., what all these guys did were building very, very big distilleries, big stills, and really looking after quality. They suddenly went, we are going to make, we are going to be quality oriented. And the quality of the whiskey begins to become appreciated on export markets. That would be France, that would be England, and Scotland as well. Then something else happens. The tax man gets involved again. Because the tax man says, hang on a minute, uh, we need to fund another war, which is quite popular in those days. You know, you, you know there's lots of wars going on. We need to fund another war. We've got excise duty. Can we tax them in any other way? 
There's a lot of malted barley get used by the Irish, especially because of big distilleries. Let's put a malt tax on. So a tax is put on malted barley. Uh, so therefore, distillers had to pay twice. So they had to pay for the finished product and they had to pay for the, the raw ingredients at the same time. Both, both are being taxed. The Irish are very clever. And the Irish distillers went, well, you know what? You don't have to use 100% malted barley, which is what they'd always done. You just need a percentage of malted barley to be able to turn all the starch into sugar. So they began using significant percentage of unmalted barley as well as malted barley to save on tax. As a result of this, they create one of the world's great styles of whiskey, which is single pot still, uh, which we'll come to in more detail uh, when we actually have a look at the James. And it really was the advent of the single pot still which elevated Irish whiskey from being an interesting and good quality spirit to something which was revered as being really the gold standard of whisky distilling. You look at uh, whisky distilling records in, in Scotland uh, towards the tail end of the 19th century, and you'll see all the big distilleries are making Irish style as well as Scotch. Uh, so it was a very, very popular style of whisky. The Scots distillers had, had spotted this, and their get out of jail card came in 1853 with the change in the law that allowed the blending together of malt whisky with the newfangled grain whisky, which is being made in large column stills, invented by an Irishman called, uh, well, a Scotsman initially, Robert Steen, and then patented and improved by a man called Aeneas Coffey. Coffee still still being used. Again, we'll, we'll touch on that uh, uh, when we get to production. Lighter in character, and blended together with the heavier, and in those days, often significantly smokier single malts. But as soon as you blended them together, you got the best of both worlds. So you got a calming down of the, the heaviness and smokiness uh, of the single malts, and you had a flavouring up of this uh, higher strength, lighter flavoured uh, grain whisky. Blended Scotch is born. And basically, Irish whisky and Scotch whisky duke it out all the way through the 19th century uh, between each other. Blended Scotch, single pot still Irish. Uh, the Irish hated grain whisky. The, the, those big distilleries uh, in, in Ireland, and in what is now the Republic of Ireland, really resisted uh, the ins installation of column stills because their style was single pot still. That was what was making them famous. So there's a real clear break uh, b between the two. And the, the guys in Scotland who were making this, uh, these newfangled blends were initially the grocers or wine merchants, but, but predominantly grocers. Uh, so John Walker, Johnny Walker, grocer. Chivas Brothers, grocers. Teacher, grocer. <coughs> uh, Matthew Glogue, Dewar was a wine merchant. Uh, Glogue, of famous guy's fame, uh, was a wine merchant. What did they know? What, why did they suddenly become experts at, at this? Because they'd been blending tea. They understood the principles of blending. Uh, I did a, uh, I was doing a kind of research in, in, into tea, kind of, kind of side, side thing, uh, early days of tea and tea blending. And I came across a book of letters uh, from, this is how exciting my life is, uh, <laughs> a book of letters from a, a, tea, uh, a tea firm, uh, two brothers, the Melrose brothers, one based in Canton and one based in, in Edinburgh, and letters between the two. And it was in these early days. And it soon became apparent of what the principles of tea blending were. It was volume to begin with. Uh, because if you were blending teas together, you didn't actually have to just sell a single unit, a single estate, which would have very limited, you know, you would have it, then it would disappear. If you blended stuff together, you would have twice as much. Also consistency, because in those days, teas would be shipped by sea. Uh, the conditions wouldn't necessarily be brilliant. It would take a long time. And the quality of the tea when it was landed wasn't necessarily brilliant. But if you blended it, you could achieve a certain consistency within your overall blend. So you had volume and you had consistency, really important. Then also, you were establishing your own style. So Mr. Melrose's style was going to be different to Mr. Lipton's, just as Mr. Walker's was going to be different to uh, Mr. Chivas's uh, down the line. So you had your own style. And then, uh, as a tea merchant, you were then selling, selling into uh, the, the individual shops themselves. And the individual shops themselves also wanted their own style. 
and different cities wanted their own style. So again, looking into Melrose's letters, there was a, he, he was writing apologetic letters, sort of saying, my dear brother, I'm very sorry. You know, there wasn't you know, email in those days. You know, my dear brother, I'm, really very, I'm very, very sorry. I didn't realise that the Edinburgh palette didn't like Lapsang Souchong anymore. And I've just sent you a shitload of it. You know. But London still does. You know, exactly the same principles that are applied to blended scotch when it appears. Volume, consistency, house style, and understanding the consumer. Because one of the great breakthroughs, what Mr Jameson uh, did... Uh, was they put their name in the bottle, but it wasn't Jameson's. You know, it, it would have the name of the grocer on it, so it would be the Mitchells, for example, but it would JJ, it'd be JJNS on it. Okay. Uh, what the difference between them and and the Scotch blenders was? So, in other words, sorry, so to go back over that. In other words, it would be the same whiskey, but just with a different label on it. So it would still be Jameson's whiskey, but it would be somebody else's label on it. Whereas what the Scotch blenders did was actually say, "What do you want to drink?" What does the London palette want? The London palette was lighter, significantly lighter than the Glasgow palette. So the blends were made to suit the palette. That was a breakthrough moment for Dewar, for Buchanan, for, for Walker, for Chivas, etc., etc. That was the breakthrough. Actually, what we now know is consumer research. What do you want to drink? The next thing that happened with it happened thanks to disaster, which struck in France. Two disasters. One was Oidium. Uh, which was a, a fungus of leaves, which reduced uh, production of wine and cognac, obviously. Uh, and then phylloxera, which hit in the 1870s in cognac, and wiped out the vineyard. And it was 25 years for, before the cognac vineyard was built up again. And cognac was, and brandy had been, the premium spirit for 200 years. If you were a gentleman, if you were of a certain status, you might have dabbled in the 18th century into rum punch. You wouldn't have been drinking whiskey, but you would have been drinking brandy, which in those days really was 100% cognac, uh, coming from cognac. Suddenly cognac disappears. And by that time, by the late 19th century, the way in which the cognac had been consumed in the fine club, gentlemen's clubs of, of, of London, etc., would have been with soda water, with charged water. Cognac disappears. In come the Irish, in come the Scots. We can do it. Give this a shot. Have you tried whiskey and soda water? Some worked, some didn't. So blends were then changed to suit being drunk long. Coming back to that really early point, Johnny Walker Red Label, classic example. Johnny Walker Black Label, classic example. Shivas Regal, Cutty Sark, all classic examples of this. Blend being made to blossom and to come into its own when it's going to be drunk long. Not being made to be sat there and sipped neat, but there to be had with ginger ale or ginger beer or soda water. And the difference between uh, one of these blends, neat, and one of these blends being drunk in the way that it's intended to be drunk is extraordinary, uh, which is one of the kind of little themes that will be kind of running through this. Do not blend. I know single malts are sexy. Single malts are all kind of, ooh, you know, touchy-feely, and it's only coming from this one place. And the distillery is lovely. It's all nice and white. And, you know, and, so and blends are just kind of, eh, you know, commercial, blah, blah, blah. Big brand. Blends are important. Blends are really, really important. Blends have quality. Blends have backstory. Blends are made to suit mixing. Blends, I would argue, uh, have greater versatility in the realm of, of mixed drinks than single malts are. Single malts are all about this kind of pointy individuality, so real intense flavours, which are brilliant, but if you've got Lagavulin, which we'll try in a wee while, you've got Lagavulin. Lagavulin is the one thing that's going to be poking through any drink. Now, that might work for some drinks, and it will work brilliantly for some drinks, but the thing about a blend is there are so many different facets to a blend, and you can pull out the smoke, or you can pull out the sherry, or you can pull out the fragrance. So a skilled bartender, I would say, has more opportunity with a blended whiskey than perhaps with a single malt. Or the same opportunities, but in a different way. Okay? So that's everybody happy. Right. Uh, what, though, was happening in... Alex Turner, good God. Uh, what was happening, though, in, in America? Uh, whiskey was being made over there as well. 
Whiskey began to be made quite early on in Maryland and Pennsylvania. The first spirit which was made in, in America, uh, other than the, the fruit brandies which had been made down in the south, uh, was rum. So from very, very early stage, really from the 17th century, molasses would have been shipped from Barbados and from Jamaica up to uh, New England, up to Rhode Island, uh, Massachusetts uh, especially, and distilled into rum. So there was a lot of New England rum, and a lot of rum being also imported uh, from the, 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 the British West Indies. Uh, that's a different talk, completely. But America was built on rum. Uh, that was its first native spirit, uh, if you want. And then there was an influx of Dutch and German immigrants coming into to Maryland, Pennsylvania, uh, who were distillers. Uh, at any point in <coughs> any spirit's uh, uh, history, maybe apart from vodka, uh, you will find a Dutchman very, very early on in that spirit's history. The Dutch were the master distillers of their era. You know, they understood the technology. They had the ingredients because they controlled the spice trade. Uh, you know, they were absolute master distillers. Uh, and they began distilling uh, when they arrived, and they used rye. Distillers used what grows around them. They used rye. Uh, and but they didn't use barley, because there wasn't any barley uh, being grown. There might have been some wheat being grown. It's predominantly rye that they, that they were growing. Uh, small amount of barley. Uh, and if you look at the mash bill of a bourbon today, that's, and the mash bill being the, the mix of, of cereals which, which goes into uh, making the spirit, it, there will be corn, it will be rye, maybe wheat, it will be malted barley. You look at the mash bill for a Geneva these days, traditional Geneva will be rye, malted barley, wheat. More recently, corn will be involved. These were Dutch. I, my, my theory, and I've, I've got no evidence in this whatsoever, but it's my theory, so you know, you'll have to listen to it. Uh, is that these distillers were coming across from, from Holland and from Germany knowing how to make Geneva. And they began to try to make Geneva. But there wasn't any juniper. Uh, so rather than making Geneva, they ended up making whiskey. Uh, I think that, that's the roots. You know, Geneva is actually a lot closer to whiskey than it is to London dry gin. You know, but, but that's another talk. You know, so many talks we could do. Uh, so that, that was the first wave. So the first whiskey style being made in America was rye whiskey. We'll have a look at rye in more detail uh, there. Then the second wave of immigrants come, come across and the eastern seaboard is full but people are beginning to head west, you know, go west young men, you know, across the mountains. <laughs> Not the Alps, you know, but across the mountains. The Appalachians, imagine that's the Appalachians, you know, boom. On the other side is the promised land. Uh, and the promised land is, is full of Indian corn. Uh, and those, that second wave of immigrants, who were Scots, Irish, uh, were given free land, cabin and patch rights, free land, if they would plant corn, in other words, to, to start establishing a community because of foodstuffs, etc., etc. Being established and established distillers, of course, they made cornbread and made cornmeal and they fed their families and more people came out, but they also distilled. Uh, because it was a hell of a lot easier to, to carry you know, a few gallons of hooch to market than it was to carry the commensurate amount of bushels of corn. And you could also make more money. Uh, so you begin to see uh, a different kind of dis distillate being made over the mountains in Kentucky, in Tennessee, uh, over there. So Ryan, kind of Pennsylvania, Maryland, and then this corn-based uh, distillate which is being made over in uh, Kentucky and Tennessee. That, that's in, predominantly in, in, in the 18th century, as this begins to, to, to build, build up. Whiskey is kind of lower class spirit, really, up until uh, post the American War of Independence. Uh, after the independent, uh, America became independent, kind of two things happened. One, the molasses supply was cut off, so America could no longer trade with the British West Indies, so all of a sudden they could make less rum. Also, they began importing less rum. Because suddenly rum, rather than being a great drink, which they all loved in their rum punches, etc., was suddenly the drink that was made by their former colonial oppressor. It was no longer patriotic to drink rum. It was, however, patriotic to make good old American whiskey made with good old American ingredients. And suddenly you see this, this 
rum from having been the most popular drink in America all the way through uh, 18th century really begin to tail off all the way through the 19th century and whiskey come into the ascendancy because it was patriotic, because it was American. It was kind of, you know, an example of America kind of coming together, establishing itself as a, as a nation. If it hadn't been for the incidents uh, which took place in 90, from 1919 to 1933, American whiskey would have ruled the world simply because it was a bigger country and more was being made. And Scotland, well, Scotland's not that big. Ireland, well, Ireland's not that big. You know, it's, it's, it's you know, population. But what did happen in 19, from 1919 to 1933? Uh, no, it was prohibition. Prohibition. Uh, yeah, prohibition. Wiped out the American whiskey industry. Suddenly you couldn't make whiskey anymore. So from nine, uh, and in fact, from earlier, you know, Ken, uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, actually went dry in 1950. Uh, so for a very, very long uh, period of time, there is no whiskey getting made uh, in America. There's whiskey coming into America. Oh, yes. There's a lot of whiskey coming in uh, to America. Uh, there's a lot of whiskey coming in uh, from Scotland. Uh, but there's not a lot of whiskey coming in from Ireland. Why is there not whiskey coming in from Ireland? Prohibition, the Volstead Act, uh, comes into force. And various people uh, go across to Ireland and knock at the door of Mr. Jameson or Mr. Power and say, listen, guy, uh, if you ship your whiskey across to the Bahamas, my friend Mr. Capone here will take care of the rest. You will have done nothing illegal. You have shipped it to somewhere where drinkers can be consumed. We will take care of the rest. And the Irish distillers all went, be gone with you. We don't want anything to do with this illicit trade. At that point, what happens is that the American bootleggers, including Joe Kennedy, JFK's dad, hightail it across to London, to St. James's, to Berry Brothers and Rudd, uh, up to Scotland, say exactly the same thing. So how much exactly do you want, Mr. Kennedy? The Irish whiskey industry goes into precipitate decline as a result of this, plus a cap on exports, plus high tax. But from a country which had well over 100 distilleries, uh, by the 1960s, there were three distilleries in Ireland. So the Irish whisky industry basically imploded uh, through the 20th century uh, to the, the effect that you know, there was hardly any whisky getting made at all. All the three uh, last distillers, uh, which are Jameson, uh, no, four distillers, Jameson, Roe Power, and Cork distillers, uh, formed in 1961 to uh, into Irish Distillers Limited, uh, which still uh, operates and, and is, is behind Jameson. That's how bad it was for Irish. So although things were bad for Scotch, all of a sudden there's no American <coughs> whiskey being made and suddenly Irish whiskey is going into this tailspin and, oh, hang on, it's only us. Yeah? So once, though, the Depression had finished and that little bit of the 1930s up to the Second World War and then post-war, suddenly Scotch is the last man standing, effectively. And this is why Scotch begins to take over, and Scotch is still the biggest brown spirit, aged spirit, or whisky style in the world. Uh, it's a matter of politics rather than necessarily quality, although the quality was good. It was more to do with politics and, and circumstance than it was uh, to do with, with anything else. Uh, and when you think in terms of what was happening in America, you know, it reopens again in 1933 and then closes again when America joins the Second World War because all the distilleries are making industrial alcohol for the war effort. And, that, and they, they then don't get converted back into distilleries making whiskey until 1946. So really from 1915, 1916 to 1946, there is virtually no whiskey getting made in the heartland of bourbon production in Kentucky and Tennessee. And a lot of the distillers which did exist in those days simply didn't bother reopening. So rather than having a big industry, suddenly it's a tiny industry post-war. Uh, but things are now changed. Okay. This means that kind of through the... We'll, we'll, we'll do Japanese when we actually uh, talk, talk about Japanese whisky. It means that all the way through the 1960s into the 1970s, Scotch had it its own way. Uh, Jameson was launched as a brand in 1970. Uh, 
American whiskey was trying to make itself uh, premiumized. It was trying to premiumize really from the 1950s onwards with some brands like Maker's Mark. Uh, but basically, it was pretty tough for both of them. And it was pretty easy for scotch. And because it was pretty easy for scotch, by the time you got to the 1980s, uh, it was getting a bit complacent. I didn't notice that there was this thing called vodka because white spirit drinkers didn't drink brown spirits. You know? And if, I suppose if you've had that level of growth for that length of time, perhaps you do think the good times are going to last forever. But all of a sudden you've got a new generation coming up who were beginning to drink vodka and they weren't drinking what their parents were drinking. So by the 1980s, late 1970s, beginning of the 1980s, you see a sudden downturn in the consumption of whiskey all around the world. People not drinking what their fathers had drank or their grandfathers had drank. We want something new. We want vodka. Gin gets hit. It's an old fashioned. Rum gets hit as it's trying to fight back with, with kind of tiki, really. Uh, and whiskey gets hit really, really hard. To the extent that uh, 40, 60 distilleries closed in Scotland at the beginning of the 1980s, never to reopen. You know, so it was a big, big hit, uh, the Scotch industry too. Uh, but, hey, everything comes back, swings and roundabouts, things picked up again. By the end of the 1990s, a new generation is beginning to become interested in Scotch again. It's still difficult to sell, you know, uh, as I said earlier, you know, when I began doing like talks on whiskey and doing training in whiskey, I, I would almost be chasing bartenders down the road carrying a bottle of whiskey going, please try it. And they're like, no, we don't want it. It's got old fashioned. Nobody wants to drink it. Single malt. It's got a lot to do with that. Suddenly people got interested in single malt because it had provenance, it had backstory, it had intense flavours. It was a really interesting and compelling drink. Uh, Japanese whiskey began coming into to Britain at the beginning of, of, of the millennium. Suddenly you've got a new and really amazing style of whiskey. Irish whiskey, Jameson, <coughs> incredible praise for Jameson because they stuck at it and just consistently backed that brand for a long time until people began going, you know what, actually this is quite good. Uh, and then American whiskey, <coughs> building up its premium category. Uh, and so you have the situation which we have today, which is all of a sudden you've got a new generation interested in flavor, interested in provenance, interested in variety, which is what whiskey offers, <coughs> unlike any other spirit. Because there is no other spirit which goes from the very, very light and delicate at one end right up to the big, heavy, either oaky or smoky at the other end, but hits every other flavor point in between <coughs> those two. No other spirit can do that. <coughs> Whiskey has it all. Whiskey is versatile. Whiskey has, has everything going for it, which is why I'm enthused about it. I'm enthused about rum, I'm enthused about uh, gin as well, but I'm really enthused about whiskey and all whiskeys because I, I think I think we've only just begun to tap into the potential that whiskey has in terms of bar, in terms of mixed drinks, in terms of serves, whether they're simple or complex, and actually talking about new styles. You know, there are so many, you know, uh, this week, Italy's first single malt was launched, which you know, is an awesome uh, drink. There are whiskey, 20 whiskey distilleries in France now. Uh, there's going to be, about f uh, there's going to be another, I think, by, Next year, if everything goes to plan, there's going to be 30 distilleries in Ireland. You know, there are at least 25 in Scandinavia. You know, so, so you know, all the, plus, obviously, the massive craft industry that's, that's happening. There's seven distilleries, whiskey distilleries now in, in England. You know, so things are really, really, really beginning to move for whiskey. So, boom. That's your history. Uh, it's that blooming fire. At least it's not belching out <coughs> dust this time, or ashes. <laughs> It was like bloody crematorium earlier. Mm -hmm. Sorry, was that was that was that a little bit? Was that a bit too dark? Uh, I remember uh, once I was. Uh, I, I don't know. It doesn't really matter if you know the woman or not. But it's actually funnier if you do know the woman. She's sometimes on Bargain Hunt. And you're a bartender, so you're bound to watch Bargain Hunt. Uh, she's a wee Scottish auctioneer called Anita. Uh, she's a very enthusiastic little lady. And uh, my, it was after my, my mother had just died, and we were clearing out the house. And there was a, a jar, a uh, kind of vase, uh, which he'd used uh, as a lamp. And it was one of a pair. My cousin had the other one. We thought, oh, we'd price it up, just and give it to her anyway. But price it up just to see if it's worth it. <coughs> Took it down to the auctioneer. 
and said to, to this woman, you know, uh, you know, clean the house, mum's just died, blah, 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 uh, you know, handed this over to her. And she automatically, being an auctioneer, turned it upside down and all these ashes fell out, which, which she then obviously assumed were, in fact, my mother's ashes and just went, ah! <laughs> no, 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 that was just to make sure it didn't fall over. Uh, anyway, I just thought I'd share that with you. Uh, okay, just to lighten the mood, let's talk about dead people. Uh, okay, uh, let's have a little look at production. Okay, any questions so far? Still awake? Sorry, right, if you don't, it doesn't matter. It makes my life oh, yeah, the, the more. Did America mostly do bourbon then? What? Did America mostly do bourbon? Or yes. Is that okay? They mostly do bourbon. Uh, they mostly do straight bourbon. Uh, rye is becoming more popular uh, after virtually no rye. That was a bit clever. Uh, after no rye uh, really being made for a very long time, rye is becoming more popular. But you're also now, because of the growth in craft distilling uh, in America, you're seeing more single malt. Well, not more single, you're, you're seeing single malt being made. Uh, there's oat whiskey being made in various places. A very good one coming from Utah. Uh, so there's really exciting new whiskey styles getting made in America. One fascinating one is, is one called Westland, which is from Seattle. Uh, made as a single malt, so made single malt style, which we'll, we'll go to in, in detail uh, in a second, but aged uh, in American, in an American way, so new wood rather than second hand wood, which is a Scotch way. Uh, Washington State peat, uh, they're just beginning to use. Uh, but also taking some principles from brewing and using Belgian beer yeasts, you know, so, so they're kind of, and, and, and that's really typical of what's happening, I think, all the way around the world, that people are seeing what the template of whiskey is, but saying, OK, you're right, I like single malt scotch, but I don't want to make single malt scotch in Washington State. I want to make Washington State whiskey. Uh, Chip Tate, uh, who used to be at Balcones, now, is now on his own, uh, kind of summed it up. He said, you know, uh, you know he's based in, in, in Texas. He says, you know, uh, I don't want to, I'm not making whiskey in Texas, I'm making Texan whiskey. And that is the fundamental building block of any great distiller, I think, working around the world. It's I'm making something from where I am, from this spot in the earth. So it's what grains grow here, what smoking techniques. Uh, in Denmark, that there's a whiskey getting smoked over nettles, because that's what they used to smoke their, their food. Uh, in Iceland, there's a, a whiskey getting smoked over sheep dung, uh, because that's what they use, because you know, it's permafrost and blah, blah, blah. Uh, it smells interesting. Uh, <laughs> it, this is not as dungy as you thought, actually. It, you know, it, it, it's a nice one. And so all of these different techniques are, are, are getting used. So, so they don't just make bourbon. They're making lots and lots of different styles now, predominantly bourbon, but that's all part of a movement all around the world. Yes, you had the question. Uh, I think it's so long to do with dungy, but uh, they're using the peat to smoke it. Yeah. That's the smoking. It's a smoking thing, yeah, which and beautifully led into it. I'll give you that fibre I promised you earlier on because that's where we're going to start off with, actually, uh, in, our, in our production talk. So, sorry. Uh, the, the rule of whisky tasting is you start light and you work up to heavy. So you start with the most delicate aromas and you finish up with the most woody or smoky, okay? So, because you're professionals, uh, we're going to start with the smokiest whiskey and work our way backwards, because you know how to do it. Uh, also, I, I think it also tells a, a, an interesting story about uh, how whiskey uh, comes together and where flavours come together. So we're kind of starting from extreme flavours in scotch and also actually in, in, in the bourbon uh, section as well. So we're going to kick off with Lagavulin. Uh, <coughs> If you have pieces of paper, you might want to, you might want to do this. Uh, this is the, the flavour map, uh, which I helped develop with the blending team at uh, Diageo, uh, really just to, to try and explain flavours in whisky. Uh, it kind of works like, like this. Can you all see it? That's really small. Uh, pa pass this around. I'll have a little look. I'll take out this book. It's a really interesting book, this, by, by Dave Broom. Uh, Available from all good bookshops. Uh, it's got, look, production, flow charts. I don't know why I'm here, actually. I might as well just read the book. Uh, pot still, uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, production, blah, blah, blah. That's me. Uh, it's 
blending. It's a nice book. It's got, it's got lots of pictures as well, you know. So, so, so if you get bored, you can just look at the pictures. Uh, so it kind of works works like this. Uh, it goes from delicate up to smoky. So anything with any smokiness is just above the line because you're immediately over the line. So that central line. So the smokier you are, the higher up that line you are. Delicate. This is basically a build up in complexity. So the more complex you are, the higher up towards that line you are. Okay. Then you move on your horizontal axis between light and rich. Light is all about kind of fresh, fresh fruits, grassy, intense aromas like that. Since you cross over that line, wood begins to become more of an influence. So the kind of soft vanilla characters of American oak up to the richer dried fruit <coughs> characters that you get from sherry. So every whiskey, you know, the, 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 it's made, made primarily for single malt rather than for blends as well. Uh, but we are going to try and plot blends on here. But it just gives you an idea of the differences between whiskey in flavour terms. There's no one better place to be in this map. It's not like, ooh, that's the best place to be. That's simply where you are uh, in terms of flavour. And from a consumer point of view, this is a really handy thing to have. Because, you know, if you have tried uh, da -da -da, Cardew, yes, yeah, so a lot of people have tried Cardew. Uh, you think, well, how am I going to try Cardew? You know, and you, you, look, you kind of look behind the bar, and so many whiskey bars are arranged on a A to Z way, which is really handy for stock taking, but not really great for consumers. Because I don't walk into a bar and go, you know, tonight I feel like an N. You know? <laughs> you know? So, but, you know, so flavor, people think in terms of flavor. So if they've tried Cardew and they see, I don't know, uh, Beaumore, they go, oh, yeah, I'll try that Beaumore. But they might not like that, it's really smoky. Uh, but they will be quite happy in that little cluster round about there. So it kind of gives people confidence. From a bar point of view, it's also useful, for it gives you an idea of how well balanced your range is. The tendency for most bars uh, is to overload with stuff above the line. Because people tend to like, you guys tend to like things that are big and smoky or the big sherry stuff. So there seems to be a, more of a preponderance towards this side and this side. Whereas these are really interesting whiskies as well. If you're going to have a balanced list, you have to try and cover all these points. So it's a handy little thing to have. So anyway, doodle it down, pass it around, doodle it down, and we'll, we'll I'll try and remember to, to, to ask you to, to plot on them. And it's a separate, <coughs> one, for, a separate one for bourbon, because bourbon operates in a different way. Anywho, uh, let's kick off with the Lagavulin which is uh, bottom left-hand side in your tasting mat with Lagavulin written underneath it. We anticipate you getting we're drunk. Missing, we're missing the Lagavulin. We're Sorry? missing it. We just, or is it? Oh, you're missing it. Like missing it. You're missing it. There you are. There's the bottle. Yeah. Oh. Uh, glasses. Uh, how many people don't have the Lagavulin? Four. Four. four glasses. If you've got four, we'll fill it in and I'll... I'll begin talking about malt production and talking about uh, Lagavulin. Okay, single malt whiskey. Single malt whiskey means the whiskey comes from one single distillery. Okay, it only comes from one distillery. It will only be made from malted barley, water, and yeast. Like all Scotch whiskies, it has to be aged for a minimum of three years in oak casks. It also, uh, the, the other little thing uh, about single malt whiskey is it has to be bottled in Scotland as well. Not, that's not the same for blends, but for single malt, it has to be bottled in Scotland. So it comes from a single place, all right? A single distillery. And that individuality, that singularity, is what is most important uh, about single malt whiskey. You, so you have 114 distilleries operating in Scotland at the moment. All of them will have pretty much the same kit. Each one of them will make something different to its neighbour. That's the point. It's about accentuating individuality and singularity for various reasons, uh, mainly to do with blending, uh, to, to, to be perfectly honest. Uh, but individuality is all about that. And bottling a single malt whisky is all about accentuating that individuality, not allowing that to be overwhelmed by oak, not allowing any immature characters to come through as well. Some of you I can see are either grimacing or, or smiling in a 
peculiar way with pleasure. Uh, feel free to add a little drop of water uh, to, to, to your lagoon, uh, should you wish, uh, otherwise you might cough. Uh, it's good for the throat. It's really good for the throat, okay? <laughs> So Lagavulin, big, heavy, powerful, rich, smoky character from the island of Isla, uh, uh, which is 100 miles west of Glasgow, next stop Canada. Uh, it's from the south coast of Isla. Not that makes any difference, that's just where it's from. Uh, how does it get smokiness? Which is answering the question here. Whiskey making is all about dis decision points. Making various decisions are important points in, in, in production process. You've got to get your barley. Your barley is basically a packet of starch. And what the, the whiskey maker has to do is make that starch available so that the starch can be turned into sugar. Because as soon as you get sugar and you add yeast to that, you're going to get alcohol. Okay? So you've got to make that starch available. To do that, you malt it. You put, you put it in water, you drain the water off, you put it in water, drain the water off. That kind of imitates what happens in the field. <coughs> so the barley thinks it's time to start growing. So enzymes are produced, which begin to convert these starches into sugars. Decision point number one. When you take that barley off the malting floor, you have to then dry it. Otherwise, it will continue to grow, and you end up with a field. And you can't make whiskey from a field. Okay? You have to make it from the barley. So you have to dry it. You've got two options here. One, you can dry it over kind of hot air, which just dries it off. Or you can light a fire underneath it, made from peat. And peat is semi-carbonised vegetation laid down over like 3,000, 5,000 years. Baby coal. But it's got very distinctive uh, fragrance to it. Uh, can smell like wood smoke, can smell like seaweed, uh, you know, can smell like uh, medicine. Uh, you know, it's, it's a very distinctive uh, aroma. So that's your, that's your option. Do I make it smoky? Sorry. Or do I make it non-smoky? And if I'm going to make it smoky, do I light a big fire? Or do I like a, like a small fire? If I like a big fire, it's going to be a big smoky whiskey. If I like a tiny little fire, it's just going to be like somebody smoking a cigarette over there on the railway bridge. You know, but it'll be there. it will be there. It's not right or wrong. It's decision points. The next step is you take that now dried barley, you grind it up into a rough flour because there's the starch. The starch is now available. And you put it into a vessel called the mash tun. And the mash tun... Uh, holds that and you pour hot water onto the top of that and that converts, that completes that conversion from starch into sugar. And the mash tun's got holes in the bottom of it where you can filter the sweet liquid out of the bottom and take it forward to be fermented. Decision point number two. If you do that quickly, you'll pull through some of the, the husks uh, from, from that ground up barley, which looks a bit like muesli, uh, and you will get a kind of cereal nutty character coming through in your final spirit. Some people want that. Or you can do it very slowly, and you won't get any of that cereal character. Or in Scotland, you'll get significantly less of it, and you'll be able to produce lighter, perhaps more fruity characters. Decision point number two. You ferment it. All the yeast, all the distilleries use the same yeast in Scotland, so the yeast isn't going to make a difference in terms of flavour. But you ferment it for a short time or a long time. Short means between 48 and 52, 53 hours. Long means 54 hours upwards. Short <coughs> fermentation will help you produce something which is light and nutty. So you get that kind of cereal character accentuated. Long fermentation will help to produce a more fruity, in simple terms, a more fruity character. So again, how long do you ferment? Long or short? You've got to remember in distillation terms, all you're doing when you're distilling is taking this beer that you've just made, your whiskey's just boiled beer, really, uh, which is about 9% alcohol. If it's 9% alcohol, what's the other 91%? Water. And it comes off the still, off the second distillation at 72%, what's happened? You've removed the water. You've concentrated everything. Alcohol boils at a lower temperature to water, so alcohol is going to be driven off first. So all the flavours that you've got are concentrated in distillation. You're not creating flavours in distillation. You're choosing flavours. You're concentrating the flavours you've made in fermentation. So fermentation is really, really important. So your next decision point is distillation. So in malt whiskey, you're distilling in pot stills, sort of like big giant kettles made of copper. 
you put the wash in there, you boil it up, the alcohol is driven off first, you, get, you condense it, you collect it, but 23%. You take all of that, you put it back in, you put it into your second still, you boil it up again. This time you're making a decision as to what flavours you're going to collect because different flavours come across at different times. The first things to come across are all quite light and delicate and fragrant. This comes volatile ones like pear drops, nail varnish, remover, etc. Then you move into kind of grassiness, that nutty character is beginning to come through. And you're moving into kind of general kind of fruity character. So fresh green apples moving up into kind of softer fruits. And then you begin to, if you've got smoke in it, the aromas are going to get heavier and heavier. And smokiness is beginning to develop until you get to kind of really big, powerful, heavy, tarry, smoky characters right here. And then after this is really disgusting, horrible, fainty stuff that you don't want, okay? So you don't want that, all right? Okay, in fact, you don't want this either, because this is like volatile heads, so you don't want, okay? So you don't want that, and you don't want that, all right? So the first thing that comes across is the heads, and you collect them, you put them to one side. And then you have the choice to collect. So if you want to make a, a delicate whiskey, you'll start collecting quite early and you'll finish quite early because you don't want any of this heavy stuff. It, conversely, if you want to make a heavy whiskey, you'll begin collecting later and you'll move right up to this point. But you don't want any of this shit either, okay? So you cut off at some point and all the stuff that you don't want, sorry, I, was, I, was just, I wasn't referring to you at that point, I was just referring to, to the stuff that you don't want. That kind of oil, oily, greasy stuff that, that you don't want at the end. That's your feint. So you've got heads, four shots and feints, heads and tails, and the middle cut. The heads and the tails will be retained, and they will go back into that still with the next lot of, of wash that's coming through. Uh, okay, sorry, the next lot that's coming, out, coming from that first distillation. All right, so some of it's always going to be recycled. So that is your decision point. Where are you going to cut? The other thing that's going to have an influence is the shape and the size of the still. The longer you allow the vapour to converse with the copper, the lighter your whisky is going to be, because copper absorbs heavy elements like sulphur. So the taller the still is going to have a lot of copper, so the lighter the whisky is if you have it in a tall still. Likely it is. You can run it against time, but likely it is. It's going to be lighter. Conversely, if you have a small still, you're going to have less chance for copper conversation you will tend to make a heavier spirit so there's decision points uh, you can make as well and we'll talk about uh, maturation uh, in, in a little, little moment or two so every distillery in Scotland is going to be doing the same but we'll be making different decisions at these different decision points so Lagavulin for example what is happening is you have malted your barley and you've dried it over a peat fire you've dried it over a peat fire for quite a long time so you've got this big powerful Lapsang Souchon pipe smoke, slightly marine character coming through. You've also got very long fermentations at Lagavulin as well, so that's going to help to promote a, a fruity character underneath, a fruity sweet, sweetness underneath all of that smoke. And I think you can get that. So because once you get through, it's a really complex whiskey Lagavulin, once you get through all that initial smoke, I think you begin to pick up those softer fruits uh, which are underneath. And if you stripped away all of that peat completely, you would have a very, very sweet uh, whiskey. Same with Ardberg. Ardberg is incredibly sweet whiskey. But again, you don't notice it because it's so, so smoky. On the palate, lovely and soft in the middle. The smoke just seems to kind of rise above it. The smoke comes through particularly <coughs> at the end. Almost it's kind of slight kind of uh, bonfire character. It's, it's like a, a spent bonfire. A little touch of that kind of salty CBD thing coming through in the finish. Big, warming, rewarding, but not necessarily everybody's cup of tea. Not everybody's going to like this style. It might be too much for some. It doesn't mean you don't like whiskey. It's a bit like, you know, you know having, having a pizza with anchovies on it, and you, you say, well, I don't like that because you don't like the anchovies. It doesn't mean you don't like food, you know? It just means you don't like anchovies, you know? But so many people have said, you know, well, I tried whiskey once, and I didn't like it, therefore, you know, the three and a half thousand whiskies which are out there are suddenly kind of swept away. You know, there will be a whiskey flavour out there for you. Which is another reason why the flavour map is good. Uh, so where would this sit in the flavour map? I'll give you the clue in this one. That's up in the kind of north, northeasterly direction. Okay, so it's smoky and it's rich. 
really, really important single mall. Let's move on. Uh, sorry, question. Yeah. You were saying that mixing in whiskeys is not a bad thing. Uh, not a bad thing. With a mixer. Yep. What would you recommend for this one? Coke. Sorry? Coke. Coca Cola. Coke. Okay. Yeah. Lagavulin and Coke is. An, Coke. is <laughs> it, Lag Lagavulin and Coke is an awesome drink. Uh, I was on, uh, I was a member of, of an organisation called the Malt Maniacs, and, and I, I think I was fired as a result of, of daring to say that. Uh, but yeah, I, I did a, another book, uh, which is cheaper than that one, uh, called called the, uh, called the, the Whiskey Manual, uh, and it tasted 103 whiskies, uh, but tried every one of them with. Uh, soda water, ginger ale, coke, coconut water, and green tea, because these are the, the, main, the main mixers. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting to see how, how different whiskies performed up against these, these different mixers. And I'd done all of the, the, the smoky islands, and, and you know, coke just did not work. It's disgusting, disgusting, disgusting. Until Lagavulin, it was kind of, oh my god, you know, this is, this is just r ridiculous. And it, it, it works. You know, it's, it's, it's like a kind of poor man's distillers edition. Anyway, it works. So, uh, you know, in simple terms, that, that's where it works. It's good in penicillin as well, actually. Uh, where's my glass? Oh, there we are. Right, second whiskey is uh, Hedonism from Compass Box. And I thought we'd, we'd have a look at this, uh, just to kind of recap on what I was talking about uh, a while ago about grain whiskey. Because this is a, a mix of different grain whiskies. Uh, made from, predominantly from corn actually, or maize, but some made from wheat, and aged in first fill American oak casks. Okay? So this is the other style of whisky which is made in Scotland. There is more grain whisky in terms of volume made in Scotland than there is malt whisky. There's fewer distilleries, but they're bigger distilleries. Uh, grain whisky is distilled in column stills, uh, as invented by steam and, and coffee, uh, and distilled to a high strength. Uh, to 90, no, it has, can't be any more than 94.8. Uh, once it's over 94.8, it loses its character, it becomes neutral spirit. So it's distilled to high strength, but you can still tell it's made from a cereal. Okay? But it is more delicate. It's higher strength, more delicate in the aroma. Therefore, a lot of uh, single grain whiskies uh, are aged in new American oak cask, or, or sorry, first fill, first time they fill the scotch, uh, American oak casks. Uh, because that gives them flavour. And this is a really good example, because American oak is very high in a compound called vanillin, which smells of... Yay! And oak lactone, which smells of... Coconut, sorry? Vanillin. Vanilla. It smells of vanilla. Uh, okay, so... And I think you get that immediately off this. So you've got kind of vanilla ice cream, you've got banana split, you've got... Uh, soft, gentle fruits. You can tell you've got a slight kind of, still little kind of dry cereal thing going on in there. A little bit of dry oak. For, you know, there's old whiskies be being used in here. But generally, you know, compared to that Lagavulin, this is very appealing, very amenable, very soft, very sweet, very gentle. Take a little sip. Completely different effect to the Lagavulin. Much more mouth coating. Softer, very gentle, quite tongue coating. That's what green whiskey does. Green whiskey, until relatively recently, green whiskey was only ever used in blends. And you know, this is one of the first to actually come out and say, you know what, guys, this isn't neutral spirit. This has actually got character. This is actually an interesting spirit in its own right. Great, and you will see more green whiskies coming out. Obviously, we've got Hay Club, uh, Grouse are about to re relaunch one, Grants are, are bringing out some, which are so so. Lots of independent bottlings. So there's beginning, there's one called 808, which just came out, which is in nightclubs, which is pretty good. Uh, so, you know, you'll begin to see more and more green whiskies coming out, and they have a role to play. You know, this is a really, really wonderful amenable. You know, that simple, you can decide I, I, what, what the best serve for this is. You know, on the rocks, it's fantastic, but, you know, it will, will offer this, this beautiful, soft, quite unctuous uh, character to it. So a great, great dram. Hedonism, and a very, very important style of whiskey as well. And it all comes together, single malt whiskies and grain whiskies come together in glass number three, which is a blend, a Scotch blend. Uh, this is Compass Box, uh, who are an independent blender. Uh, and this is their uh, Great King Street, this is the Artist Blend, 
There is also one called the Glasgow Blend, uh, which has got a bit more dried fruit and a bit more smoke character to it. They're both really, really excellent blends. Relatively high malt content in this. Uh, and made, remember what I was saying earlier about how whiskies were made to kind of suit the serve. Uh, this is good on its own, it's good on the rocks, but really it's made to be a highball whiskey. You know, this is made for Mamie Taylor. You know, the Mamie Taylor being ginger beer and a little bit of lime, which predates the Moscow meal, by the way. It's a whiskey drink before it ever became a, a vodka drink. It's just everybody forgot who Mamie Taylor was. She was an actress. Not a very successful one, obviously, but she was an actress. Uh, so what you have here uh, is a blend of malt whiskies and a blend and a blend of grains as well. To give this uh, quite delicate, uh, slightly more apple kind of green grassy uh, character, a little kind of soft fruit uh, coming through here, but pear. Think of your, your own descriptors, it's just what I, I'm getting. And a little taste. I think once you've tasted the grain, now you understand what grain does in the blend. Because all of a sudden, in the middle of the tongue, you've got this softness and this silky character that you really only get from the grain whiskey. So that's where the grain is coming in. And the malt is kind of fly, firing out on either <laughs> side of it. So you've got this, this uh, little touch of spice, tiny little touch of spice on the end. It's almost like, like poached pears, a little touch of clove and poached pear, nutmeg on, on, on the end, and that kind of green apple character as well. Very, very well balanced. So again, think about where, you, where you, would, you would put that. For me, I'd probably have that down in the kind of southwestern quadrant somewhere in there. Uh, but really, really good. The, the map, uh, the, the matrix was kind of made for, for single malts. So it's slightly hard to, to, to put blends uh, in there, but, but you can try. Like kind of white chocolate as well beginning to develop. Lovely, lovely blend. So, you know, this kind of paradigm that, that's, that's been established, which is, you know, uh, malt's good, blend's bad, ain't true. You know, they, they are different beasts. They're very, very different beasts. They each have their, their own part to play in the whole whiskey repertoire. Uh, but you know, I, I kind of went on about uh, how important blends are for, for you guys. So please don't overlook blends. We're going, going to move on to our, our, th uh, our second blend here, which is Jameson. Uh, Jameson 2 is a blend. It's a blend of green whiskey uh, made at Middleton Distillery and single pot still whiskey made at Middleton Distillery. So Middleton became the big distillery in Ireland. It became the only distillery in the south of Ireland, actually. And then it was Bushmills uh, up at the top. So yeah, it was two distilleries, actually, by, by 1960s. Uh, but very, very complicated and you know, a complex distillery. And although it's one big plant, it doesn't mean that they don't pay huge, huge attention to the quality of the spirits coming out there. Uh, what you'll find in the, the Jameson range, so if you went from this up to gold, up to 12-year-old, 18-year-old, etc., etc., you'll see the percentage of single, of single pot still increase as you move up the, the, the Jameson scale. Uh, and single pot still gives you this real fruity, apple spiced character, but also a kind of oily texture to it, which, you, which combines very nicely uh, with the grain, I would say, in Jameson. Jameson, personally speaking, I wouldn't necessarily drink it on its own, but I would have it with ginger. Jameson ginger, great. You know, I would have it in all manner of, of, of mixed drinks. You know, it is a blend. It is made to be played with. It's made to be enjoyed in that particular way. But I think when you have it... In this way, which is an honest way to assess it, you get some kind of uh, <coughs> dried grass, but kind of coriander coming through. And on the palate, you get that real kind of soft, almost peachy, oily character. And then on the finish, that little kind of crisp apple once more coming through. But it's that kind of slightly oily texture you get in the middle. That's what's coming from the single pot still. If you're interested in single pot still, I would definitely go out and get yourself a bottle of Red Breast or uh, Powers John Lane, uh, John's Lane, which is like the biggest, oiliest, <coughs> most robust uh, of them all. Or if you want something a bit more restrained, one called Green Spot. 
Uh, and if you want, you know, as I said, you can move up through the Jameson range to see the influence of pots still in blends. Or if you happen to be going to, to Ireland uh, and flying to Ireland and going through GT3, there's one uh, brand called Crested 10, which has got a really high percentage of pot still in it, and it's, it's great. And it's really good value as well. Fantastic, fantastic whiskey. The Jameson, you know, really, really important. You know, the Irish whiskey category is on fire now, and it is thanks to Jameson, you know, from being absolutely consistent and backing this brand when all seemed lost, consistently backing this brand for two decades. And, you know, all of a sudden you've got Dead Rabbit, you know. Uh, thank God, and you've got this really, really exciting renaissance taking place in, in Irish whiskey. So an important style. And I think you can, you can see, tasting alongside the Great King Street, how it's different, how, how that single pot still uh, comes in rather than, the, rather than malt whiskey. We're going to take a, a detour down to the bottom right-hand corner and have a look at Hibiki, Hibiki 12 years old. Uh, it seems to be more logical to, 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 to put the Hibiki uh, in, in, in at this point. Uh, the Japanese have been making whiskey a long time. The Japanese have been making whiskey, uh, distilling whiskey, since 1923, when Yamazaki was established. Japanese have only been exporting whiskey since about the year 2000 because they drank it all themselves. <laughs> Simple as that. You know, Suntory Old was selling 12 million cases in Japan in the 1970s. You know, Johnny Walker sells 18 million cases globally. You know, I mean, they drank a hood of a lot of whiskey, uh, as, as we say in Scotland. All blends. Yamazaki was the first single malt to be launched in, in Japan, and it was launched in the 1990s. You know, so it was, it was a blended, blended industry, okay? Uh, I know we've got really excited about Japanese single malts recently, but like Scotch, the industry was built on blends. Uh, very good Japanese whiskey bar just around the corner here. Uh, Anyway, uh, have a look at this, Hibiki, 12 years old. If you went around the Japanese distillery you'd, and you'd been around the Scotch distillery, you would say it's pretty much the same kit. And you'd be right. And the barley even comes from Scotland. But like all great distillers, the Japanese have gone out of their way to make sure that their whiskey is Japanese. Uh, that it appeals to Japanese palate, that it can be dr drunk with Japanese food, and it somehow chimes with a kind of general approach to, to food and to even to art and, 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 and design in Japan. But it has this simplicity and purity of character. And I think you get this real heightened, pure character in Japanese whiskey, which you don't get in Scotch. And it's not right or wrong, it's just it's more accentuated uh, in Japanese. <coughs> uh, transparency to Japanese whiskey. You can see, almost see the aromas more clearly than, than you can in, in, in Scotch or, or indeed in Irish. One reason for that comes from early on in the process. Remember that decision about do I pull through cereals or do I keep it clear? The Japanese keep it clear, but they keep it ultra clear. So you don't get a cereal. Unless they deliberately want a cereal character coming through, you won't get that kind of nuttiness, which is really a signifier of scotch. If you put a, uh, a scotch up against a Japanese single malt, you would immediately pick up the, the scotch you, because it all of a sudden seems really quite cereally. That's the Japanese way of making it. Japanese climate comes in to, to, to influence. Japanese oak for some brands as well, for Yamazaki especially, older expressions of Yamazaki. And in Hibiki, which is, as I said, is a blend of whiskies from Hakushu, whiskies from Yamazaki, and grain from the Chita distillery, grains from the Chita distillery you've got this beautiful kind of harmony of, of characters coming through. I said whiskey is plural because in Scotland, <coughs> uh, distillers swap stock. So if Diageo need a specific flavor from a specific distillery owned by Chivas, they will exchange stock with Chivas. So there's a lot of bartering goes on between companies in Scotland. That doesn't happen in Japan. So the distilleries are set up to produce as many different styles or variations of a style in one distillery as they can, so they're set up in completely different ways. Uh, so anyway, let's have a look at Hibiki. You see that immediately, that, that, that intense, uh, almost perfumed quality to it. Little touches of, uh, of kind of rose, cherry, <coughs> a pineapple note, which is very kind of, uh, Hib uh, very Yamazaki for me. Coming through, gentle, fruity, take a little taste. Creamy, unctuous again. Uh, peaches, persimmon, 
red fruits, kind of strawberry characters. Lots of kind of creamy vanilla character. And then, just as it finish, you know, uh, I've always said it about Hibiki 12, it almost teeters on the brink of becoming a bit flabby. You know, it's almost a bit kind of, if it kept going in that way all the way through, it would just kind of, it would just kind of collapse on the, on the palate. But the finish, it suddenly picks up. You get this real kind of blast of acidity in the finish. And that's coming from some Yamazaki, which has been uh, aged in casks, which had previously held uh, Japanese plum wine, umeshu, which is a really, really acidic uh, wine. Uh, and very Japanese uh, <laughs> technique, they, they decided umeshu is never aged. So they went, well, what happens if we age it? You know? So they took some umeshu, put it in whiskey casks, and took it out and went, oh, that's quite interesting. And they went, well, what are we going to do with the casks now? Oh, let's put some Yamazaki in it, see what happens. Uh, and that's been used uh, in, in that. And that's what gives you that lovely kind of red fruit uh, acidity on, on the back palate. It just kind of freshens everything up. I think a fantastic, fantastic blend. So you've got three great blends there, but operating completely different ways. Uh, it's a really good uh, way of uh, looking at that. So again, don't ignore blends. Uh, before we move on to, to <laughs> bourbon, uh, I think I'll have a little little chat about maturation, if you don't mind. Because there's a fundamental difference between what we've tasted so far in terms of the casks used and what we're about to taste in respect of the casks used. By law, yes? Anything you think is good to mix with this? Or? What do you think with that one? It's really good with it's coconut water. You know, and I'm just thinking in terms coconut of, I, I, yeah, I think in, in, in really simple simple mixes. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's got that kind of yeah hedonism script as well. Yeah. yeah, play around with it, think about it. Yeah, yeah, it's been good. Uh, yeah, because by law, American American whiskies or sorry, straight bourbons uh, and rye, etc., can only be aged in brand new charred casks. Why brand new? To protect the cooper, <coughs> to protect the coopering industry in the 1930s. It was a change in law. Imagine what it was like, you know, prior to that, a cast would be used once, twice, three times, four times. Uh, but if only a handful of distilleries reopen after prohibition, suddenly you've got the coopers going, well, actually, if that happens, as soon as we make casts for these four or five distilleries, they're not going to come back to us for 30 years and we'll be out of business. So the coopers, the coopers union got this uh, clause put into the, the bourbon regulations saying that only new wood could be used. Okay? So... That's what American oak uh, is all about. So let, let's have a little look. And the same principles of, of maturation apply to, to bourbon, to Japanese, to, to, to any cask aged spirit, uh, to be honest. And it falls into to three camps. The first camp is subtractive maturation. That means taking stuff away. So it's in patronizing, you know what subtracting is. It's taking stuff away. In simple terms, it's about if you taste white dog, if you taste the, the new make spirit, it's aggressive. It's high strength, it's aggressive. In Scotland, it might be slightly sulfury, because you get that from barley. Uh, and while it's interesting, well, it's you know, a fascinating thing to look at, you wouldn't really want to drink it all night long. Uh, that's one reason why whiskey goes into casks, because it has to go into casks, because it needs to be mellowed off, it needs to be rounded off. This stuff needs to be removed. And the cask does that. Either it's absorbed into the charcoal layer uh, of, the, of the charred cask, or it simply evaporates off uh, through the cracks in the cask as part of the, the exchange with, with the air. Subtractive maturation, taking the stuff you don't want away. Then you've got additive maturation. That's all the flavour compounds which are in the cask coming into the spirit. So that could be vanillin, which we talked about. It could be that oak lactone coconutty thing. It could be the stuff from, from, from the, the, the toast levels, uh, which are kind of caramelised uh, notes, uh, chocolatey notes, which are actually coming from the char itself, kind of fur for all. Uh, if you're dealing with uh, sherry, sherry casks, you'll get aromas which remind you of resin or, or aromas that remind you of clove and, and dried fruits. So all these are beginning to be leached in. Uh, the next thing that happens is interactive maturation. So you've got stuff that's come away, then you've stuff that's come in, and these two elements are kind of sitting next to each other. So you can say, well, there's the kind of oaky bit, and there's the spirit bit. They're not quite knitted. It's interesting, but it's not quite knitted. 
And then interactive maturation means these flavours lock together and new flavours are produced with the effect of oxygen as well. And this is where the magic happens. And this is the bit that the scientists don't understand. They just know it happens. It's hard to predict exactly what happens, but this is the interesting stuff, the interactive. And that takes time. How long it takes depends on how active your cask is. If you've got a brand new cask, which is obviously what you're using in America, imagine the, the oak is being like a, a, a reservoir of flavour. That reservoir is going to be full because the oak is new. Therefore, when you put spirit in, in the States, boom, you're going to get a big hit. The tannins are coming in, all the flavours are coming in from the wood, the colour is coming in as well. That's what one reason why the bourbon is not allowed to be coloured up. It's one reason why you'll find much, much uh, more vibrant, darker colours in bourbon. In Scotch, we use second-hand casks because we don't have any trees. Uh, so we always use second-hand casks. When you use a, a, what, we, what we call a first fill cask, first time it's been filled with scotch, it's not going to have as much flavour as, as it had when it was used in the bourbon industry or the sherry industry, but there will still be quite a lot. You'll still be able to tell there's vanillin coming through, which you saw in the hedonism, for example. But we're mean in Scotland, you know, we don't throw stuff away. So if we've aged it for, say, 12 years in this first fill cask, we empty it and we fill it up again. The next time we fill it up, this is, it applies to Japan and Ireland as well, there will be less flavour in the wood. So the effect that you get after 12 years will be different. You won't get as much of the, of the big oak influence coming through. You'll see a little bit more of the distillery beginning to come through. So it's going to be a more interesting balance and a different balance of flavours. You can empty it out and fill it up again and keep it for another 12 years. And again, the profile, the flavour profile will be different. So in other words, if you are a distiller or whiskey maker, you've made your whiskey, this is the Scotland, Ireland, Japan, you've made your whiskey, you've put it into either ex-sherry or ex-bourbon, first fill, you get two different results. You then put it in refill, you get another two different results. You put it in another refill, you get another result. So that's a huge parameter of different flavours that you can produce from one distillate. So in Scotland, Ireland, Japan, a lot is, is being played around with the, the activity of the wood, how active that wood is, how, how are the flavours coming from that wood interacting with that spirit. So that is where a lot of research is going on. How can you produce something which is beautifully balanced? Because ultimately, the cask will win. Unless the cask is completely exhausted, the cask will eventually dominate the whisky. And you don't want that. You don't want a mouthful of splinters. You, know? you, know, you want to be able to taste that distillery, you want to be able to say, you know, this is a pleasant drink, and a too weedy whiskey isn't. So you have to have this really quite deep understanding of what casks are, what flavours casks produce, and what flavours casks produce at different particular, at different times. So it's a complex kind of matrix of, of flavours going on there. But it also means that older isn't necessarily better. Because an older, an old cask can be way too old, can be dominating. It can be, again, just too weedy, too stringent. Or it can be exhausted and nothing happens. So you could have a 20-year-old whiskey which is way overcooked. You could have a 20-year-old whiskey which is beautiful. You could have a 20-year-old whiskey which is so undercooked it might as well be new make. Or you could have a 5-year-old whiskey which is in a really active cask which is already hitting the start of its maturity. So don't get carried away by numbers, guys. Always think about what the cask is about. Numbers will lead you down really, really strange uh, dark alleys. <coughs> you know, your age is just a number. You know, uh, maturity is a character. That's what you need to, to, to think about. Uh, so let's move on. I, uh, having kind of talked about maturation, let's move on to four whiskies which have all been matured in brand new wood. Uh, and we're going to kick off again with uh, probably the most extreme example here. Uh, so we're going to kick off with Rittenhouse, Rittenhouse Rye, uh, bottled in bond, 50% ABV, okay, so be, be prepared, it's a bit pokey, 100 proof, uh, so 50% ABV. As I said, Rye whiskey was the whiskey which made American. It was the most popular style of whiskey really up until Prohibition. Uh, and then obviously the distillery uh, closed down, but actually during Prohibition, 
and post-prohibition, the American palate changes. And the American palate, by the time people began drinking for pleasure again, uh, post-war, uh, the American palate had gone really quite light. One reason that, that Scotch appeals is Scotch is actually a little bit lighter than those old styles of whiskey, like those, those old big Fusely rye uh, styles. Uh, and rye whiskey really fell from favour completely. Uh, some of it was made while Turkey still made some, Heaven Hill stayed, still made some, uh, but not a lot was made, really until bartender began to take off again, uh, really only like 10, 20 years ago. And bartenders began going, well, you know what, I, I've been looking at all these, these books and they all mention rye, but I can't get rye. Uh, can you make it for us? Boom, it's back again. And this really gives you an idea of what rye whisky is all about. Intense. OK, it's high alcohol, but it's intense. It's got that slight kind of dusty flour, rye bread character to it, a real spiciness to it, that kind of crackling spicy to the spiciness. Uh, a lot of kind of clove uh, influence coming through here. Lots of kind of red fruit. Often get kind of maraschino notes of, 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 of all bourbons. So I think it's a wood thing, the maraschino thing. Now take a little sip and just be aware of what happens in the palate. Think about where we've been, you know, in terms of the hibiki with that kind of softness and gentleness. What's, what's this going to be like? It's going to be higher in strength? Yes. What's it going to be like? Mm. <coughs> Hello. <laughs> rye, rye is not shy, yeah? <laughs> Rye comes swaggering in. You know, rye is not polite. Rye barges open that door in your mouth and goes, I'm here, guys. <laughs> Deal with it. You know? Uh, and that's what's great about it. You've got that real intensity to it. You've got that real acidity uh, to it. This wonderful kind of sourness uh, that comes through, that kind of sour cherry, uh, sour apple uh, note. Lots and lots of spiciness coming through in the finish. That is what rye is about. Uh, so absolutely superb. You know, I, I, I love rye whiskey, and when you begin looking back through, so, you know, you make a Manhattan, for example, with this, or you make a Manhattan with Maker's Mark, you will really see the difference. Not better or worse, but you can really get an idea of what 19th century cocktails are about. I'm a great believer uh, that you know, if you're making 19th century cocktails, you should try and use 19th century drinks. Uh, you know, so if you're making 19th century gin cocktails, use Geneva or Old Tom. You know, and they, you know, they're just better. You know, and, and, you know, an aviation made with an old, old Tom is just better than one with London Dry. Anyway, uh, that is what rye is about. It's about intensity, spiciness, acidity, this kind of bravado, uh, just coming through and saying, right, I'm here. So let's move to the opposite spectrum of the scale. Let's move to Maker's Mark. Maker's Mark, a really interesting story about Maker's. Uh, the distillery was founded in 1953, so at a time when bourbon was really in pretty rough shape. Uh, you know, post-war, distilleries not necessarily reopening. It was expensive to reopen, as I said. Uh, the Samuels family went, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna make whiskey. But we're gonna make whiskey in a different way. We're going to make whiskey inspired by Pappy Van Winkle, uh, who made wheated bourbons rather than rye-influenced bourbons. So they took the <coughs> rye out of, of, of the mash bill and put in wheat instead. Okay, so the mash bill for, uh, for anything that says straight on it, so straight bourbon, straight rye, straight wheat, straight means minimum 51% of the grain mentioned on the label. So minimum 51% rye in the written house, minimum 51% corn, up in its bourbon. It is usually 70%. Okay? Uh, some distilleries uh, reveal what their mash bill is, some don't. It really doesn't matter. Uh, but I will tell you, I'll try and tell you, if you can remember. Uh, makers, 70 corn, 16 wheat, 14 malted barley. Uh, they will all use malted barley because of its enzymes to turn all these starches into sugar. Okay? So let's have a look at this. Now think about the mash bill. The next one, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about distillation. Uh, so kind of moving backwards, okay? By taking out the rye, you remove all that spiciness. Uh, and you get this more kind of sweet, candied character. It's not that wheat itself is sweet. It's more that, that wheat helps to accentuate the sweetness of the corn. Uh, sweet, uh, sweet. Wheat is actually slightly angular. So it's, it's got this 
a slight tightness I always get with wheat on, on, on the back palate. Uh, there's a very, very kind of direct quality uh, with wheat. But you get much more kind of candied fruits, softer, more gentle, again, slight kind of floral uh, elements coming through here. The wood is there, but the wood is extremely well balanced. Little touches of chocolate underneath. Take a little taste. Completely, you know, how different is that to that rye? You know, it's lower proof, but I mean, it's not that much lower, you know, it's 45%. But it just comes in, it just comes in like a charming southern gentleman. It just comes in, you know, rather than kind of barging in and kind of causing chaos, it comes in very politely. But it is there immediately and all the way through your palate. Just talking very gently, I think that candied orange really comes through. That little bit of dryness is coming from the, the, from the wood, and that's something that distillers have to be very aware of. You know, if you're using new wood, you're going to get wood influence, you know, so you will always get wood influence in, in, in bourbons. But you can offset set that with, 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 with ice, offset, offset that with, with vermouth, et cetera, et cetera, to, to add that little bit of sweetness to kind of cut down on, on, on the tannins. But I think a beautifully balanced, gentle, uh, polite bourbon. I think it's extremely well made. Which just floats, and rather than picking up and attacking you almost uh, like, like, like a terrier at your throat, uh, as rye does in that, in that really wonderful way, very, very discreet, very gentle. Great, great uh, whiskey. And that is what wheat does. So, in other words, what one thing that a, a bourbon distiller uh, will be looking at uh, will be, what is my mash bill? You know, what influence, you know, what, what do I put in my mash bill? Do I use rye or do, do I use wheat? And then what percentage of rye and what percentage of wheat? Because uh, obviously the more rye you use, the more spicy it's going to become. Or do you want something controlled? The other thing you can play around with is yeast. Uh, and the other thing you can play around with is sour mashing. Okay? So we'll talk just a little bit about sour mashing uh, for a second. But we're going to try Woodford Reserve next, by the way, guys. Uh, some brands, I mean, Jack Daniels, for example, has got sour mash uh, on the label. And not surprisingly, that means that most people think it is the only whisky that is sour mashed. But they all sour mash. Sour mashing is a matter of principle uh, for 99.99% of bourbons. You occasionally get sweet mash. Uh, Woodford actually, actually did a sweet mash. Sweet mashes are dif uh, difficult uh, for reasons I'll, I'll explain in a second. Uh, All distillers talk about water. The one thing I really haven't talked about is, is water. Does water have an influence on flavour? No, not really. But the minerals within water could well have some influence on the way that yeast behaves. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, the Japanese. The no, actually, it, it's all it's all quite it's all quite soft water there. But I know what you mean by that, that kind of mineral equality. Uh, and sometimes you get that mineral quality. There's actually a little bit of uh, smoky whiskey uh, in, in that hibiki. And I often get a kind of mineral quality in, in smoky whiskey, very lightly smoky whiskey. The smoke just seems to, se seems to turn it. But yeah, 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 no, it's a good point. But yeah, I mean, high mineral content. So, so in, in uh, Kentucky, Kentucky, Tennessee, on a limestone shelf, so it's uh, hard water, alkaline, okay? rather than more acidic water that you get uh, in, in Scotland. But it tends to be softer. Uh, not 100%, but it tends to be softer. Does that have an effect on flavour? Mm, we can debate that. What it does have an effect on is fermentation. Because yeast works better in an acidic environment. So in order for the yeast to work better, what you do is add sour mash. It sours it. It adds acidity to it, so it allows the yeast to work. It was always used, uh, or widely used, uh, in Kentucky and Tennessee, uh, but really at this distillery, Le Brown Graham Distillery, which used to be the old Oscar Pepper Distillery, there was a, a scientist called uh, James Crow. James Crow was Scottish, I'm proud to say. Uh, James Crow was really, I think, probably the first scientist to work in the whiskey industry, you know, the world whiskey industry. Uh, he brought in hydrometers. Uh, he began to really apply science to, to, to whiskey making. 
Uh, and one of his great breakthroughs was, was perfecting the idea and the principles behind sour mashing to actually get balanced fermentations and then to actually then, by, in, by raising or lowering the percentage of, of souring agent, affecting flavour itself during the fermentation. How you produce sour mash? Well, you ferment, so, so basically it's a bourbon uh, distilling 101. You take your grains, you cook your grains, uh, you add your malted barley, convert it in, into uh, fermentable sugar, so you have a, a wash, which then you, you uh, add yeast to, and you will have a wide variety of different yeasts being used across uh, the bourbon industry. Four Roses, for example, has two mash bills, five yeasts, making ten different whiskies aged separately. So each Four Roses is going to be a different blend going on. But each distillery will have their own yeast or yeast strains. Okay? So, so that, that's the difference. Then distillation, apart from one distillery, which is LeBron Graham, uh, will be distilled in a single column still. Uh, so you basically you put your fermented wash in the top and this column still uh, is separated by, by plates, uh, perforated plates, and the wash kind of zigzags its way down. And as it zigzags its way down, it meets live steam, which has been injected from the bottom. The live steam rises and because alcohol boils at a lower temperature to water, the hot steam drives off the alcohol vapour, the alcohol vapour is carried up across, is condensed, and then there's a quick second distillation in a thumper or a doubler. Okay. That's, how, that's basically what happens. So you've got this alcohol, and then you've got this liquid, which is left with no alcohol in it, but which is really acidic, and that's your sour rash. And you take that, and you put it either in your cooker, depending on, on what principle uh, you work, you can put it in the cooker, you can put it in the, in the uh, fermenter at different percentages. Uh, so it's yours to play around with uh, as you wish. It was originally a rum technique. You know, if you've, if you've tried Smith & Cross, you tried Smith & Cross rums? Uh, which, you know, awesome rum. Uh, or Appleton Estate, you know, in Jamaican rum. You've got that real kind of funky, pungent character coming through. That's from the use of dunder in the fermentation process uh, in Jamaica specifically. That is sour mashing and it predates bourbon distilling by about 100 years. So it's, it's a rum making technique that was then adapted uh, in Kentucky uh, for, for, for uh, whiskey production. Yeah. I give you that for nothing. All right. Uh, so, uh, so we have LeBron Graham. Uh, Interesting because the LeBron Graham distillery itself has pot stills rather than this column still. Uh, so some of this is distilled in pot stills and some of this is made at Shively Distillery in kind of standard, standard ways. Same Mashville. Mashville, if you are interested, uh, has 18% rye uh, in it. Okay? Eight, one eight, 18 percent rye. And I think you, know, you can go back to your glass of makers and then you put your nose in, in the Woodford and it's not a huge rye hit, but suddenly you, you kind of, oh, yeah, OK. Yeah, I know where you're coming from. You know, I can see where, that, I can see where those spices are, are coming from. You know, that kind of, almost, it's more of a kind of peppery character, uh, I, I think, with the Woodford. But it's quite sweet, uh, quite gentle. It's, it's sweeter than the Makers, somehow. More kind of sugary, more kind of caramelised uh, in character. A little tobacco, uh, kind, of, kind, of, kind of hinting in there. Tobacco is coming from wood. As is chocolate, a tiny touch of chocolate. Here. On the palate, it's quite soft to begin with. It hasn't got that immediacy of, certainly of the rye or, or of the makers. It's quite shy to begin with. And it really only begins to kind of pick up momentum in, in the middle of the tongue. I think that tobacco thing really comes through on the finish. You've got that little touch of rye, that chocolate, chocolate covered cherries, little touch of citrus. Well balanced, quite gentle, a gentle, well balanced bourbon. Uh, well made, well made. So I said, patronising. Well done, well, well done, chaps. Yeah, keep going. Uh, as we will uh, onto our oh, crematorium again. Uh, right. <laughs> our final dram uh, is wild turkey. This is Wild Turkey uh, 81. Uh, if you can find it, the Wild Turkey 101 proof uh, is, is your boy uh, to go to. But Wild Turkey, the, I don't know if any of you have had the privilege of meeting either 
Jimmy or Eddie Russell. Uh, Jimmy Russell has been working as distiller at uh, Wild Turkey for 65 years. You know, yeah. Come on. You know, what this man does not know about bourbon isn't worth, you know, right about. His son Eddie has been ha the boy, the newcomer, has been working there for 40 years. You know, so you know, between them, they kind of know bourbon, and. Jimmy is one of is, is sadly the last man standing fr from from the great gang of of old time distillers like Booker No and Elmer T Lee and Jimmy who believed in old style bourbon, who believed that bourbon was big and bold and was packed full of flavour. Never ever, if you ever meet Jimmy, never say he makes whiskey. He does not make whiskey. He makes bourbon. Uh, and something happened in America in the 1950s, 1960s, uh, because scotch was in the ascendancy. What a lot of distillers uh, or distilling companies decided to do was try and ape scotch by either making American blended whiskey, which can use refill casks and use more green whiskey, or lighten up bourbon. And light bourbon <coughs> is not nice, you know, it's not nice. But Jimmy stuck to his guns. And sales were pretty big. You know, first time I went around Wild Turkey, the place was, you know, obviously loved, but there wasn't a huge amount of investment put in it. They, they put it that way. You know, it was kind of ironclad and teetering on the, on the edge of a, of a precipice, because it does actually sit on the edge of a precipice. But they were proved right, these old timers, because eventually the pendulum swung back and people were interested in flavor once more. So Wild Turkey, stick your nose in the glass for that, tell you the, the mash bill for this. Uh, well, it's 30% small grains, uh, of which uh, the highest percentage is going to be rye. So you've got much more rye content coming off here. It's distilled to a low proof as well. So it's taken off the still at a lower strength than either Makers or Woodford. And that is going to give you richness and heaviness. It's going to give you more powerful, oily characters coming through for its lower strength. Also put into barrel uh, at, at lower strength as well. So you're dealing with a much more bigger, round or more big boned bourbon. Go for something like Russell's Reserve or higher proof. You can cope with higher proof wild turkey. You can definitely pick up the rye coming through here, I think. So you really now can begin to identify rye. You can go back from this into Woodford, back to the Makers, and then back to the Rittenhouse. You can really understand what rye is and how that corn, how corn uh, interferes in, or, or participates rather uh, in this really kind of um, and, uh, kind of cooked corn, sweet corn kind of way. It's a fatness uh, somehow to corn. Ripe, spicy, but quite honeyed as well. So it's kind of dark honeyed. Lots of kind of slightly richer fruits coming through, more black fruit characteristics rather than the red fruits which we saw earlier on. And on the palate, texturally behaves completely differently. And the rye came kind of swaggering in there. The makers really coated the tongue, kind of moved all the way through the tongue, kind of rippled across the tongue very nicely. The Woodford, quite shy to begin with, quite discreetly moving across. Wild turkey comes in, mm, and it's there. It's right there in the middle of the tongue. Uh, it's almost like you almost have to chew it. You know, there's a real kind of tact, a real tactile quality about wild turkey. And again, you know, the older. Uh, uh, expressions, uh, Russell's Reserve or, or the higher proof of this, I think really helped to accentuate uh, that, that character as well. Great, great whiskey. Uh, but they're all great whiskeys. Uh, it's like that Father Ted moment. Oh, you've all got lovely bottoms. Uh, anyway, it's... Uh, sorry, that's a long story. Uh, it wasn't me, it was Father Ted. Uh, anyway, uh, that's whiskey. Well, it's some whiskey. You know, we could have done others. Uh, we could have done more. Uh, but you would have fallen asleep and thrown, thi thrown things at me. It's just a taster of what is out there. Some of the different styles. You know, we only looked at smoky whiskey from Scotland. You think of the, the variety that's in Scotland uh, alone. You think of the variety that's coming out of Ireland. You think of the, the variations you can play by blending uh, in Japan. You think of the variations you can play with mash bill uh, and also a warehouse conditions uh, in, in, in Kentucky or sour mashing. So it's a huge, huge world of opportunity uh, for you to explore. Uh, so I hope you do. And I, I'll see you, fingers crossed, later on in the year. Uh, we'll do all of this again. 
uh, but in even more geeky way. Okay, thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. <laughs>